In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Bible study tonight from Psalm 40. Psalm 40, we are going to start from verse 9. From verse 9. Uh, this psalm actually was written by David. But almost every single verse can be a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we will study this psalm, we will apply it on David and also as a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ, but also it can be applied upon each one of us in our life. Lessons to learn how to apply this in our life. So verse 9 I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord, you yourself know. So David said he had glorified God among his people, and he would not restrain his lips in offering this praise and glorifying God. Uh, and as I said, all the psalm, so in previous verses from verse 1 to 8, all these verses can be applied on the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So verse 9 also, it was very true about the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. And by the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ preached the love of God the Father to all mankind, not by human words, but by shedding his blood. So the love of God the Father toward us was manifested in a very practical way on the cross, that he did not spare his only begotten son, but he gave him up on the cross for the salvation of mankind. He said, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness. The good news of righteousness fully declared and demonstrated in Christ. When the God the Father sent the Son into the world according to his promise, and also allowing the Son to suffer death uh, for and, and put on the Son the sins of the whole world. He became the Lamb of God who carried the sins of the whole world. He said, I proclaimed the good news of salvation in the great assembly. Great assembly means the most public assemblies, not only to the Jews, but to all other nations. The Lord Jesus Christ, before his ascension, he said, go and preach the gospel to the whole world, to all the world. So Christ preached the gospel himself, and also through his apostles, he preached the gospel to the whole world. And I don't restrain, indeed, I don't restrain my lips. I don't restrain my lips means he did not keep back anything in his ministry that was profitable, but had taught the way of God in great sincerity and spoke freely. The same words, actually, you can read them in Acts chapter 20, when St. Paul said, I did not delay to uh, tell you about the good counsel of God. So Paul, as a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ, did not restrain his lips from preaching the good news of salvation and to tell us what's beneficial in our uh, spiritual life. The Lord was not only the Redeemer, but also he was the teacher and the preacher to men. The Lord's whole life was a sermon. So we did not learn from his words, but also from his life uh, example. 
as St. Saint Peter told us, he left to us an example to follow his footsteps. He taught openly in the temple and was not ashamed to be a faithful and true witness. He was actually the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest evangelist. And St. Augustine made comment on verse 9. He said, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, now addresses his members. He's exhorting them to do what he had already done. And as I told you, these verses we can apply it to David, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and there is lesson for us. So as the Lord Jesus Christ has proclaimed, these are the words of St. Augustine, let us declare also, as he suffered, let us suffer with him. As he has been glorified, we shall be glorified with him. St. Augustine continues and comments on, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know. I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know. St. Augustine says, it is one thing that men hear, another thing that God knows. So that the declaring of it should not be confined to lips only. So St. Augustine saying, when we preach the good news of salvation, should not only be preached by our lips, but it should actually be manifested in our life, in our actions, and in our deeds. St. Augustine said that it might not be said of us, whatever things they say unto you do, but do not after their works. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ about the, the, scribe, the scribes and the Pharisees. He said to the multitude, whatever they tell you, do, but don't do according to your works. So St. Augustine is telling us, let our works actually match our preaching so that the Lord will not say to others, whatever we tell them, do it, but don't live according to our life. Also, St. Augustine continue, lest it should be said to the people, they are praising God with their lips, but not with their hearts. Again, the Lord said about Israel, these people praise me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. So if our declaration of the salvation only by our lips, not by our life, then the Lord says, these people glorify me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. That's why David said, I do not restrain my lips. Oh Lord, you yourself know. You yourself know that my life is fitting and matching what I preach and what I declare with my lips. Verse 10, St. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I did not hide it, but I preached. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. So the righteousness of God was evident in both David's words and actions. So he is saying, I did not hide your righteousness in my heart, but it was very clear in my words because I declared the good news of your righteousness and also in my actions. So as if the righteousness of God was not set in a secret place within the heart of David that has no connection with how he actually lived his life. Verse 10 also is very true about the Lord Jesus Christ, who poured forth what was in his heart from his lips. He spoke the doctrine of righteousness with great simplicity of speech. He was the greatest teacher of the law and of the gospel. He had fully communicated this knowledge, the righteousness of God to others. 
the Lord spent his life in making known, known the great truth about the righteousness of God. So he was not silent. Then David said, I have declared your faithfulness. God made many promises through the prophets. When these promises were fulfilled in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, then the faithfulness of God was manifested. What God promised through the prophets now is fulfilled in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the exact fulfillment of the promises made by the prophets in regard to the incarnation of Christ and opening the door of faith to the Gentiles, these promises were fulfilled in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus Christ shown to men, to us, that God the Father is a merciful and forgiving God. Usually Satan tries to give us opposite message, that God doesn't like you. God will not forgive you. God is upset with you. God is ashamed of you. That's what actually Satan is trying to convey to us. But the Lord Jesus Christ has shown to us that God is a merciful God and forgiving God. Do not fear little flock. It is your heavenly Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. These are the messages that the Lord Jesus Christ is delivering to us about God the Father. So the gift of Jesus Christ reflect and shows God's mercy, kindness, and loving kindness. Verse 11. From verse 11, David started to appeal and ask God for deliverance. So in verse 11 he said, Don't withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. So the scene changes starting from verse 11. The psalmist represents himself as overwhelmed by so many afflictions, so he is pleading for a speedy help from the humiliation of his wicked enemies. But we will notice that in the midst of this distress, his trust in God remained unshaken. He said, do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. This prayer is spoken by David, but can be applied also to the Lord Jesus Christ. The words and expression of confidence and in the certainty of God's response. So when he said, do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord, David was confident that God will uh, respond to him. In uh, verse 9 and 10, the last two verses, David expressed that he did not restrain his lips. So. As David did not restrain his lips, in the same way he trusts that God will not restrain his tender mercies. As David declared the righteousness of God and the faithfulness of God, not only in words but in action, so he trusts that God will not restrain his tender mercies from David. And as David has not ceased to acknowledge God's loving kindness and truth, so this loving kindness and truth will not cease to protect David. It is a declaration of his confidence. David in verse 9 and 10, he said, I, talk to the, I declare to the people your loving kindness, your truth, your faithfulness. So now it is time that this loving kindness and your truth and your faithfulness to protect me from the enemies that are surrounding me. Verse 11 can be also the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ during his life here on earth, especially during the time of his suffering on the cross. Christ
prays to the Father not to delay the same mercy and justice he made known of the Father to mankind. In his ministry, he declared to us about the mercies of God, the loving kindness of God toward us. So, Jesus also speaking to the Father that he does not delay his loving kindness and his mercies toward him by speedy resurrection from the death to deliver him from the death and the passion. Uh, why David actually said, do not withhold your tender mercies from me? The answer to this in verse 12, for innumerable evils have surrounded me. Innumerable. The, I, I cannot count them. Innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities has, have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. So there are two reasons. The first reason, the evils around him, countless, innumerable, surrounded him. The second reason, David also is confessing his sins. My iniquities has, over, has overtaken me. I cannot actually look up. Do you remember the tax collector when he entered the temple? He could not look up, but he beat his chest saying, God have mercy upon me, a sinner. So David is saying, my iniquities has over, have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. He said, my iniquities are more than the hair of my head are more than the hair of my head. That's why my heart fails me. So the reason he is asking God not to withhold your, his tender mercies from David because the innumerable evil that surrounded him. So David needed this constant supply of the mercy, loving kindness, and the truth of God because also he knew his own sins. He asked God not to leave him to his many sins. His sins are more than the hair of his head. But he is asking God to deliver him from his sins. He is overwhelmed by his iniquities. And unless God actually lead us in repentance and deliver us from sin, who can deliver us? So the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross can say innumerable evils have surrounded me. But what about the rest of the verse? Definitely the Lord never say, my iniquities has overtaken me. This cannot be applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was and is the spotless Lamb of God without any sin or defect. Yes, evils surrounded me innumerable, can apply to the Lord Jesus Christ because his suffering were truly without number. And in his suffering, he willfully identified with his people, taking on their sins as his own. So on the cross, actually, he is the Lamb of God who carried the sins of the whole world. As John the Baptist said about Jesus, and also it was prophesied in Isaiah about Jesus Christ, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins and carries the sins of the whole world. So when David said, my iniquities, my iniquities have overtaken me, how can we apply this to the Lord Jesus Christ? Me, we can apply it this way, that the iniquities of mankind which the Father placed upon Jesus, as we read in Isaiah 53, which uh, Jesus actually took them as his own iniquities. St. Paul said about the Lord Jesus Christ, he who is without sin became sin. He who was, is without sin, he became sin. So, for Jesus, they were my iniquities, not because he committed these sins, 
But because out of love, he chose to bear them and to bear all the wrath that they deserved. That's why David said, and also can apply to the Lord Jesus Christ, my heart fails me. The Savior's soul was so burdened with the multiple pains of the divine penalty that he was very heavy even unto the sweat of blood. In Gethsemane, his sweat became like drops of blood. And he said, my soul grieves unto death. His strength was gone and he was in agony as we read what happened to him in Gethsemane. David, despite his many iniquities, but he still trusts God. He rely upon God for deliverance. That's why in verse 13 he said, Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. And there is a big lesson for us. Sometimes when we feel that our iniquities are overwhelming us, Satan tells us, don't pray. God will not listen to you. How can you pray while you have all these iniquities? But here, let us learn from David. In spite of what he said, my iniquities has, has overtaken me. They are more than the hairs of my head. But he is saying, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. So David is not asking God to deliver him only, but asking God to take pleasure in delivering him. Be pleased to deliver me. So he could ask boldly because he believed it to be consistent with God's pleasure. It's God's pleasure actually to save us and to deliver us from uh, our sins. And David request was made with urgency when he said, O Lord, make haste to help me. Verse 14, let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. We should not understand this verse as it is a wish or a desire from David. But it is a confident expectation. David, because he knows the faithfulness and the righteousness and the justice of God, so this what he is expecting. It is a confident expectation about what happens. It implies the certainty that they would not be successful. His enemies will not be successful. And they will be hindered in their purposes. So David was so sure that their plans will be defeated, the plans of his enemies. But again, this verse can be applied about the Lord Jesus Christ. In every way, it is an appropriate prayer that the purposes of those who would defeat the plan of the Lord Jesus Christ, his plan to save us, the purpose of his incarnation. So he is praying that these plans will be defeated, to be laid down in order to execute the divine plan and the divine economy in saving the, man, the mankind. Uh, the Lord Jesus prayed in, in Matthew 29, 39, that the cup of sorrow might be taken away. Also, he is saying those who seek to destroy my life, let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. When you read the four Gospels, you will find that many times they tried to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. They conspired several times to kill him. And his life 
was in danger. Many times they want to stone him, they want to kill him. One time actually they want to throw him from the cliff. And they wanted to do this before his time has come. The purpose of his enemies was to take the Lord's life and to prevent the spread of his doctrines. This was the purpose. But according to God's economy of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ was to die at a certain time and in a certain manner crucified. And he should die at the time which had been foretold by the prophets. So any time they want to kill him before that time was defeated by God. So uh, if actually uh, this plan, the divine plan, could be defeated if they put him to death by stoning or any other way before the time that was planned. But definitely they cannot defeat the plan of God. They cannot defeat the uh, divine economy. Their plans were defeated. The second part from uh, verse 14, he said, let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Do you remember when they went to the garden to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ? And they asked him, we are seeking Jesus of Nazareth. And when the Lord told them, I am he, what happened to them? They were driven backward. So. Let them be driven backward exactly like those who were came with Judas into the garden to arrest and capture him. You can read this in John chapter 18, verse 6. And let them brought to dishonor who wish me evil. The hosts of darkness will be completely defeated, and all the attempts of Satan will be put to infinite destruction. Verse 15, let them be confounded because of their shame, who say to me, aha, aha. Verse 15 repeats the same thing for the third time. And verse 14, it was repeated twice, the same meaning. Verse 13, the third time. So the rich deadness that occurred in the hearts of Satan and evil men, by envy, malice, disappointment, and despair, shall be a fit reward for their cruelty to the Lord when he was in their hands. So this shame, this despair, this disappointment, befit their cruelty, how they were very cruel with our Lord Jesus Christ. Aha, aha, these are words of expression of joy exalting at the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ um, on the cross. So people, when they saw the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, they thought that their plans were successful. And actually, they boasted and were happy, joyful. They thought they overcame the Lord Jesus Christ and congratulated each other because of this. Verse 16, let all those who seek you rejoice. That's the opposite of verse 14 and 15. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. So the psalmist cannot long be satisfied with mere prayer for self. So he is not satisfied just to pray for himself. But he extended his prayer and supplication to cover the whole body of the faithful, the whole body of the believers, all those who seek God. Uh, and as he actually uh, prophesied and expected confusion to the persecutors, now 
he actually protects and expects joy to his followers. He called the people of God, those who are seeking God, to be happy in him and to say continually, the Lord be magnified. Those who seek the glory of God, who love him and put their trust in him to rejoice and to be glad, to rejoice with this divine and unspeakable joy. So if the wicked mocked him saying, aha, aha, mocked the Lord Jesus Christ, namely with the spirit of rejoicing over his suffering and over his crucifixion. On the other hand, the godly praise and rejoice when they see God glorified in him, God the Father glorified in the Son. So the wicked seek the destruction of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the godly seek the salvation of the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ from death. So the humiliation of the wicked gives a reason for the righteous to rejoice. The righteous rejoiced not because they are set free from persecution, but more importantly, they rejoice because it is a proof of God's righteous sovereignty and the revealing of his purpose of salvation. So when God defeated the plans of the evil people, the godly rejoiced, not because now they are free from suffering, but because the sovereignty of God is manifested. The purpose of God in saving his people is fulfilled. Verse 17, which is the last verse in this psalm. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks about me. I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Usually if a person poor and needy, he will be forgotten by many, many people. But it's beautiful here to say, I am pure, I'm poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. So David could combine his sense of great joy in God with realistic thought of his present need. He said, innumerable evil surrounded me. So perceiving all this evil around him, he said, I am poor and needy, but secure in the truth that God cared for him. God is thinking about him. So David is appealing to God to be his help and deliverer. I know, although I am poor and needy, but you care about me, you think about me. That's why I appeal to be my helper and my deliverer. And I need you to do this without delay, without delay. Poor and needy, in the Hebrew text, the, the, the words, poor convey idea of poverty. But needy convey the idea of affliction. He is afflicted. And again, poor and needy can be applicable to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, St. Paul, Paul said about the Lord, he became poor although he is the rich. So the Lord Jesus Christ in his life here on earth, he did not have a place to rest his head. He was poor and needy. And in a spiritual sense, he was forsaken by his disciples on the cross. He was surrounded by his enemies. He had the sins of the people on him. He has the curse of the law, as St. Paul said also, that he became cursed. And he has the wrath of God upon him because of the sins that he carried. But However poor and afflicted, he appeared to the people, but he was rich by the protection of his father. That's why he said, the Lord, the Father, thinks about me, thinks upon me. 
why he is calling the father Lord although he and the father are one but he is speaking this in the person of a servant he identified himself with us he became the son of man and the words the Lord thinks upon me he explaining at length what does this mean you are my helper you are my deliverer you think about me not just thinking but you are making action to deliver me to protect me you are my helper you are my deliverer God the Father cares and thinks for his son by helping and protecting him but in the same way he cares and thinks about each one of us he said my eye is upon you from the first day of the year to the last day he actually has us on the palm of his hand and he protect us he told us I will never forsake you or leave you even if the mother forgets her infant God will not forget us do not delay oh my God meaning deliver me from all the, the, the trouble as he raised the Lord Jesus Christ on the third day speed resurrection so this psalm was written as if David's eye laid upon the suffering Messiah it is written in a prophetic way uh, as afflicted crushed broken forsaken with all the woes related to the work of salvation and all the sorrow expressive of the evil of sin compiled upon him but in spite of all of this in spite of all of this he was confident in God that the father thinks in him and he was so sure that he will help him and deliver him by speedy resurrection St. Augustine says what are you to do then poor and needy one so that's listen for us sometimes we feel we are afflicted we are persecuted we are going through distress we are going through difficult time so St. Augustine is asking us what are you to do then poor and needy one big before the gate of God knock and it shall be open to you and what are the arms let the beatitude answer blessed are the poor in the spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God so knock on the door of God God will be your helper and will be your deliverer and will give you the kingdom of heaven this actually concludes uh, Psalm 40 Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.